we've been focusing on God restoring the home, and our focus started with the individual. And then this morning, we talked about God restoring couples. And at this time, we're going to talk about God restoring families. Because the reality is, is that a lot of our families are under attack. Um, We're living in very serious and solemn times. And Jesus is coming soon. And he is determined to make sure that our families are ready to meet the Lord. And I'm here to let you know the truth, beloved. I'm not here to lie to you, like I told you earlier. Just because our children are in the church does not mean they are safe. I'd love to believe that being in the right place means you're in the right condition. But I'm reminded of a story in the Bible of a man who knew that a destroyer was coming for him. And he ran into the temple and held on to one of the holy articles in the temple. And when the destroyer came, the destroyer paused and said, well, Let me find out what to do. And he went back and said, well, he's in the church. And he's right next to the holy articles. What should I do? And the instruction was to go in the temple and to slay him right there, holding on to the holy articles. Our children are not safe just because they're in the church. Our children are safe when they are in Christ. That's the difference. And so I don't want us to think that we're having a false success because we say, well, all of my children are still here in the church. The real question is, has yours and my children learned to deem Jesus their best friend? Have they learned how to love him more than they love their own goals, their own objectives, their own ideologies? And the reason why this is so important, beloved, is because I'm going to show you some things from the word of God that are true. And no one can change it as far as its general truth. But we can change whether we or our families will be subject to some of these things that we will study. And so we are going to go through this very serious and solemn study of God's plan to restore the home pertaining specifically to the family. And as we prepare our hearts for this message, once again, it is imperative that we go upon our knees and that we pray and ask God to do something special with our hearts. And so I would like to invite you again, as you are able to, to kneel with me, and I'm going to kneel. And and if you can't kneel, it's all right. You bow your heads where you are. But if you can kneel, let's kneel together and let's pray that God will do something special to prepare our hearts to receive the word. Our Heavenly Father, we are very grateful, Lord, that once again we have an opportunity to hear heaven speak. And Lord, we need you to speak directly to our hearts, directly to our families. You know the dynamics of our homes. And Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you will please help us. Help us in our homes to become one with thee. And Father, I know that it is possible for that which is impossible with man is possible with God. And so increase our faith even as we study together. Enlighten our minds and send your Holy Spirit who's the only effectual teacher of truth. And may he minister to our hearts and open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your word. This is our prayer that we do ask. In the worthy and mighty name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. I want us to turn our Bibles to the book of 1 Peter chapter 5. There is a counsel that comes from God 
And as I often say, Jesus was many things to his people, many things. But the one thing Jesus was not and is not is a comedian. What do comedians do for a living? They tell jokes. And if there's one thing I learned about Christ is he's not joking when he gives counsel. When he gives counsel, when he gives instruction, he means every bit of what he's saying. He's not joking. And the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, right there in verse 8, the Bible says, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The scripture is clear. We have an enemy. We didn't ask to get into a fight, but we're in it. And there's nothing we can do to change that fact. We are in a war. We are in a war. We're in the middle of a great controversy. The great controversy is between Christ and Satan, but it's over the mind of man. And as a result of being in the middle of this war that we did not ask to be a part of it, I totally get it. I grew up, you know, before I was 15, I probably got into at least 30 to 50 different fights. And I remember growing up in New York in, in, in the public school system, and, and I remember, you know, guys would just come up and hit you. Like, you're minding your business. And I remember that when one guy hit me one time, I remember my first response was, why did you do that? What did I do to you? That was like my question that I asked. And I realized that sometimes all I had to do was be the wrong complexion. All I had to do was just wear the wrong clothes that day. They didn't even need a real reason. And they would go ahead and start a fight. So from a child, I, I had to get into fights where no young person should have to go through stuff like that. But here it is, the Bible is letting us know we're caught in the middle of a war. We are in a battle. And we did not ask to join that. Please, family, I understand that, okay? I understand. You did not wake up in the morning and you did not say, where's Satan? Let's start a fight. I get it. You didn't do that. But the Bible lets us know something. Go to the book of Isaiah 63. In Isaiah, the 63rd chapter, the Bible contextualizes why Satan is our enemy. We didn't go around trying to start a fight with him. We didn't try to pick a fight. I get it. But the reality is, is we're in it. And the question is, why? Why is he coming after me? Why is he coming after you when we did not pick a fight with him, yet he's picking a fight with us? And the answer is very simple. You heard me mention earlier that we're in the middle of a great controversy. The great controversy is between Christ and Satan, because that's what Revelation 12 teaches. Revelation 12 says there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon is Satan. Michael is Christ. So there's a war between Christ and Satan. But how did we get caught in the middle of this? Well, the Bible says that Satan lost that initial fight and got kicked out of heaven. And he landed here on earth. Now he's coming after you and he's coming after me. And the question is why? Isaiah 63. In Isaiah 63, starting at verse 8, the Bible says, For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their what? Savior. Now, the word Savior, that's the last word in the verse. So when you go to the next verse, it's still speaking in the context of the Savior. So look at what the next verse says in verse 9. It says in verse 9, in all their affliction, that's the people, it says he was afflicted. Who's the he? The Savior. You just got your answer. In all our affliction, who's being afflicted? Christ himself. You see, you and I are not the joy of Satan when he makes us fall. We're not the joy. The real joy of Satan 
is every time he tempts you and every time he tempts me and then we give in and go ahead and commit the sins that he wants us to commit, what Satan does is he knocks us down and he looks in the face of Jesus and says, is this what you died for? Look at what I'm doing with them. Look at what I'm doing to and with the people you died for. How does this make you feel, Savior? He throws it right back in the face of Christ. Satan's satisfaction in the game of life is hurting the heart of Christ. That's what he's after. And Jesus has united you and I as his children so closely to his heart. And every parent in this room should know what I'm talking about. That when you see your child suffering, who else is suffering? We are. It breaks our heart when we see our children going through pain and suffering. And that demonic mind of Satan knows that. And so he says, if I can't get you, I'll get them. Because every time I get them, I get you. You see, I don't know if you, heard, if you remember the study earlier. The study earlier today, I talked about the wife being the rib. And one of the things the ribs do is it protects those vital organs like lung and heart, right? Did you know as God's wife, we were called to protect God's heart? And isn't it crazy how every time we sin, we break his heart? Go to Psalm 69. If you look at Psalm the 69th division, the Bible spells this out. I always wondered about that. You see, whenever I read the writings of Ellen White, one of the reasons that I'm convinced that her writings are inspired is because of how incredibly harmonious they are with Scripture. The way that I read Ellen White's writings is I'll look at anything she says, and then after I look at what she says, I'll say, hmm, Ellen White's writings are like a magnifying glass. A magnifying glass does not put something there that wasn't there. A magnifying glass does not take away something that was there. A magnifying glass only makes clearer that which is already there. So whenever I read deep points from Ellen White's writings, I always say, Father, where's that in the Bible? So one day I'm going through that book I recommended last night that we need to study to get to know him, Desire of Ages. And I was reading Desire of Ages, page 300. And in Desire of Ages, page 300, it says that it was not the thorns on the brow and the spear in the side that killed Jesus. It says Christ died from a broken heart. And it was our sins that broke his heart. So that's what it said in the book. So I said, Lord, where's that in the Bible? Because a lot of my friends are people who are not Seventh-day Adventists, and I can't go to them with thus saith Ellen White. I have to help them see thus saith the Lord from the Bible. And you know what God was so gracious in what he did? He took me to Psalm 69. Look at verse 20. The Bible says in Psalm 69, this is what we call a messianic psalm. It says in Psalm 69, verse 20, a psalm talking about the experience of the Messiah. It says in Psalm 69 and verse 20, reproach hath done something. What did reproach do? It hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. This is talking about Jesus. So did Jesus have a broken heart? Yes. Now, what was it according to the verse that broke his heart? Reproach. So what is the faithful Bible student going to do next? Lord, what does reproach mean? Go to Proverbs 14. I went to Proverbs 14, just pulled out my concordance and looked up other areas in the Bible where the word reproach comes up. I found Proverbs 14. And notice what the Bible says. In Proverbs, the 14th chapter, right there in verse 34. In Proverbs 14 and verse 34, what does the Bible say? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You'll remember it was the prophet Daniel that came before God. And Daniel himself, after God, gave him this incredible vision of the 2300 evening and mornings. 
And after he had that vision, Daniel gets so sick, he doesn't even understand what's going on, but it was enough to make him sick to his stomach. And the Bible says he was in bed for a long period of time, but eventually he got his strength back. Daniel 9 kicks in. The first thing Daniel starts doing is he starts praying and intercessing on behalf of his people. And do you know Daniel 9, 16? Daniel says, Lord, forgive us, for we have become a reproach unto you. They knew we're in captivity because of our sins. Sin is a reproach, and reproach broke the heart of Christ. So Jesus died from a broken heart of which we inflicted it upon him as his children. So God says, I need to fix this problem. God knows that we as his people have lost our focus. And the reality is, is that we are under attack. You see, last night I showed you that synonymous to the heart in the Bible is the home. And the same way that Satan wanted to attack the heart of Christ when he walked on this earth, Satan is now attacking the heart of the church, which is the home. And this is the reason why it's so important for us to understand what was God's plan, what was God's blueprint for families. Not just merely individuals, not just merely couples, but also families. You see, we are told the greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. This will recommend the truth as what? Nothing else can. For it is a living witness of its practical power upon the heart. This is why Satan says, I don't care how much they preach as long as I have success in their homes. Satan does not care. He's not threatened. Because it's going to take a lot more than powerful preaching for the finishing of God's work. And this is why as parents, I know a lot of parents, I know, I know a lot of evangelist buddies of mine, their, their families are in absolute disarray. And they'll say things like, well, I got to go preach the three angels' messages. I got to finish the work. I can't be worrying about this. That's their choice. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm sorry, brother, you're giving up a little too early. Maybe there's more work for you to do. My children are grown now. Listen, grown is relative. <laughs> you know, 18 does not equal grown. 20 does not equal grown. I used to work at a facility where I took care of 60-year-old men who act like children. So that term grown is relative. And the question is, do you still have influence with your child? Do you still have influence with your son? Do you still have influence with your daughter? Is there some areas where maybe you could impact their lives for positivity, for righteousness, and for good? And if you can, then there's still more work for you to do. Somebody says, when is my work finished? It's when you're finished. You see, we have no problem quoting, honor thy father and thy mother. And we love the story when Jesus is on the cross at 33 and a half years old. And he's still honoring his mother. He looks at John and says, John, take care of my mother. Behold your mother now. Mother, you're going to be taken care of because I want you now to behold your son. Jesus was still honoring his mother as a full-blown adult. So should we dare think that our job is finished when our children are 33? There's still an influence for righteousness God wants us to exercise even toward our adult wren. And so it is that God says, listen, your work's not finished yet. Don't give up too quick and start saying, oh, they're grown already. It, it's their choice. It's like, well, yes, it's true. You can't command them as you would when they were five or ten, but there's still an influence for righteousness, that God says, there's still some work for you to do. You see, we need to understand that, again, broken homes, right? 
We talked about this. We talked about the connection of family with the broken homes. Remember that? We talked about the, 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 the stories of Rehoboam and Ammon and Hophni and Phinehas. Remember how their fathers influenced them. What was going on in their homes was influencing them, unfortunately, for unrighteousness. But the hope is that God says, if a parent can influence their child for unrighteousness, then you better believe a parent can influence their child for righteousness. And this is one of the reasons why, as you heard in the scripture reading of Malachi 4, God has given us the Elijah message. The Elijah message is about connecting us back together as families so that we can be, listen, God is a God of decency and order. Do you believe that? Amen. That's right. That's what the Bible says. Now, because God is a God of decency and order, go to Luke 16.10. Let me show you something. In Luke 16.10, I really like Luke 16 because it's a powerful biblical principle, okay? Powerful biblical principle that we should live by. Luke 16, and notice what the Bible says in verse 10. Luke 16 and verse 10. Very powerful principle to live by, all right? Very hard principle to live by, but very powerful principle to live by. Luke 16 and verse 10. If you're there, say amen. amen. The Bible says in Luke 16 and verse 10, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. But he who is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. This is the formula for success in life, temporal and eternal. Be faithful in the little things. Okay? Be faithful in the little things. Now, I've learned this. Uh, we believe that Jesus is not merely in heaven, but we believe he's in the heavenly sanctuary. We also believe that he's not just in the heavenly sanctuary, but he's in a specific place in the heavenly sanctuary that is termed the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy Place. The work that he is doing is not merely interceding, but he's also doing the work of judgment. Now, understanding that, the purpose of him doing the intercession and the judgment is that he can eventually come to a conclusion that he can cleanse the sanctuary because he brought the people into right experience and right relation with himself. Am I doctrinally accurate so far? Amen. Now, if I want to appreciate Christ doing a cleansing work in the Holy of Holies, Shouldn't I demonstrate my appreciation of that cleansing work by keeping my room clean? If I can't appreciate the importance of a clean room, why would I stress the importance of a clean sanctuary? If I can't be faithful in the least then how can I expect to be faithful in much? Do you know that that's the best way to teach your children how to keep their rooms clean? You let them know to say, hey, listen, you know, we got to keep our rooms clean. Why? Because the same way that we have a clean room, God wants to clean our hearts so he can cleanse that sanctuary and we can go home with him forever. So the next time your child says, mom and dad, my room is clean, you can say, all right, it's time for an investigative judgment. And you walk throughout that room and you are making sure that there is no spot on the dresser or wrinkle on the bed. Isn't that something? You can have fun with it. You can enjoy it, right? But God is trying to say, if we can't appreciate the smaller detail, then why are we going to make all this to do about the eternal details? Now, as that is true with the sanctuary, it's also true when it comes to family. If you and I are not trying to become united with our earthly family members, how do we honestly expect ourselves to just suddenly have all this love for our heavenly family members? 
Go to 1 John 4 and let me show you how God expressed this thought. <laughs> you see, there is a need for a reform in the home. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, right there in verse, notice this now, 20. God already makes this point clear. In 1 John 4 and verse 20, the Bible says, if a man says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, he is what? He is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Do you see how God did that? There's no way we're going to have all this heavenly union, but we're ignoring emphatically our earthly union with our family members. Doesn't work. And so the Elijah message is a twofold message. The Elijah message is to work on earth as it is to work in heaven. If you and I are going to be reunited with our heavenly father and the host of the brethren, then that means that we need to be working right now for the unity of ourselves and all of our brethren. And so when I look at the Elijah message, it is a message where God is trying to unite the hearts of people on earth so that we can be united with God in heaven because you got to be faithful in that which is least while you're preparing to be faithful towards that which is much. If you're following what I'm saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. amen. Now watch this. The home. In the black community in North America, often, sadly, there are a lot of homes without fathers. It's a terrible thing, and it needs to be addressed. And you have these incredible stories of mothers who, against all odds, brought up their children had them go to school and accomplish great things, even for the Lord. And so often, it will be stated, mother is the center of the home. But that's not true. The father is the center of the home. The reason should be obvious for those of us who are here, because we saw earlier that there are three things that every father is supposed to be, head, lawmaker, and priest. We already studied that. Central influencer in the home. Inspiration says a father is bound to his family by sacred, holy ties. Every member of the family centers in the father. His name, house band, is the true definition of husband. This is why, beloved, I told you earlier, it's a sacred and solemn thing to be called a father. It is a sacred and a solemn thing to be called a husband. And I'm sorry, you cannot be too busy for your family and receive the approval of heaven. And it might mean that there's a need for career change. It might mean that there's going to be a call for sacrifice. For what does it profit a man if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? You know, one of, the, one of the great mistakes that I made as a world evangelist, big mistake. It's hard not to cry sometimes when I think about it. It's, it's, it's like I remember I was traveling with my family, doing ministry, Saving souls. And I knew the challenges that it imposed on my precious wife. You see, I had real strong bounce back. I could bounce back. I could fly from California to Africa, get off the plane and say, let's do the meeting. But my wife didn't have that. She would go through jet lag, right? Right? The children would go through jet lag. So, you know, I did everything I could, you know, get the homeschooling. I gave, I gave them everything they needed so they can carry the homeschooling with them and all these other things. And bless their heart, 
They followed the leader. But I know that I kept them in an environment of irregularity. You're jumping from one time zone to another. People want to be like me and my family. Oh, we want to travel and do ministry like you and your family. I'm like, no, you don't. That was one of the worst mistakes I did to my family. I did it with a sincere heart. I really, really thought, man, I'm following the blueprint. You know, I really did. But I wasn't paying attention to the fruit. You can grow a tree, family, and you can say, it's an apple tree. I know it's an apple tree. Look, it's an apple. Look at the twigs. Look at this. Look at this. But once you see oranges, you should stop all your apple talking. It's clearly not an apple tree. When I'm going with my children traveling from one country to another, from one state to another, what am I doing? I'm going around. Nope, it's the blueprint. It's God's work. It's the blueprint. But my lovely wife would say, honey, look at the fruit. Pay attention to the fruit of what's happening in their characters. They need more regularity. They need more this. And you know what my excuse was to keep going? I kept saying, Look at all the souls that are being won. While I was losing the four chief souls that I was in charge of. And God was saying, listen, Dwayne, your first work. You see, when I stand before Christ, I can say, Lord, look at how many people I won to you. God's going to say, yes, yes, thank you. Where's your children? Where's your wife? Husbands and fathers, I'm telling you right now. You can say, I gave out tracts, I gave out books, I preached, I taught, I did, I did, I did. God is going to say, thank you very much, much appreciated. I will deal with them when it's my time to talk with them. But right now, I need to ask you a question. Where's your wife and where are your children? What happened? Why are they not here? And you got to have a good answer, family. Everybody centers in dad. And there's no job on earth, though you're reaching people and all the rest. You know, one of the most solemn sermons that I've done, I don't, I don't comment a lot on my sermons, especially positively. But this one sermon I did, I said, now, Lord, that was deep. I didn't even realize how deep this sermon was. Probably one of the deepest sermons that I've preached in years was a sermon that I did at a camp meeting earlier this year. Lord impressed it on my heart strong. The sermon was titled, What Do You Do When Your Gifts Are Flourishing But Your Fruit Is Rotting? And that whole sermon was based on the life of Samson. I have never done a sermon like that before. I was just like, mercy. And I mean, people were weeping at the end of that message. They was like, my God, they said, this is me. It was like such a heart-searching message. What do you do when your gifts are flourishing? You know, one of the reasons why we keep going is because we're watching the gift flourishing. Do you know that every time Samson kept doing the evil stuff that he did, God was still doing incredible miracles through him. This brother's tearing doors off the hinges. He's beating up people with a jawbone of an animal. He's doing all sorts of miraculous stuff, and he allowed his mind to see his gift flourishing, and he wasn't paying attention to the fruit of his character that was rotting in the process. When he began his apostasy, mom and dad find me a wife of the heathen nation. A little later on, this brother's now at a whorehouse. He was getting worse and worse and worse and worse. He wasn't paying attention to the fruit of his character because he was too focused on the flourishing of the gifts. Y'all be careful with that. Just because your gifts are flourishing does not mean you're right. Look at all the people I'm blessing at my job or my business. That's why I give so much time to it when the fruit of your womb is rotting. Right in front of your eyes. 
God says, fathers, it's a sacred and holy calling to be a father. It's a sacred and holy calling to be a husband. And the influence in the home is very powerful, right? To a large extent, not a small one. To a large extent, parents create the atmosphere of the home circle. And when there is disagreement between father and mother, the children partake of the same spirit. I am warning you ahead of time. Some of you might come to me and say, Brother Lemon, I need you to talk to my son. I need you to talk to my daughter because they're so rebellious and they don't listen and they don't do this and they don't do that. And what I often say and what I will say to you if you ask me is I'm going to say, well, since you're inviting me in your business, I'm going to dig deep in your business. How is your relationship with your spouse? I remember I did that with a sister. She wanted me to get on her child. Boy, she wanted, to get, she wanted me to get him. She was like, brother, let me get my son. Just get him. Hard-headed and everything. Get him. And I was like, oh, I said, get him? I said, I'm going to get him. I said, I'm, I'm gonna get, can I get him right now? She said, yes. I said, all right. Whoa, wait. First, before I get him, let me get you. She said, what do you mean? I said, what do you mean what I mean? I said, it, I said to a large extent, children are a reflection of what's going on in the home. So if there's all this rebellion going on in your home, I need to ask you some questions. How's things going between you and your husband? Is it possible that you could be inviting demons in your home that are taking possession of the minds of your kids? You see, this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about how we can get some of those demons in the heart of our children out. But you're going to be amazed, parents. It's going to require your cooperation and your surrender and the reality is is that a lot of our homes are struggling a lot of our homes are in deep 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 trouble we have walked around with false satisfaction oh my son is going through all the adventist schools so we must be doing good that's not necessarily true i know we want to believe that and i know it sounds fantastic but it's not necessarily true i have realized that I don't want my children to be good, lukewarm Christians. If you're going to be in the world, then go be as cold as you can be, because God would prefer that even over lukewarmness. If you're going to stay in church, then be on fire for God. But please, family, for the love of Christ, break out of this false security of just merely they're in the church, so everything's okay. Or they're playing music so everything's okay. I have gone to so many countries and so many places, and I'm not here to discourage. I'm just simply saying, family, get connected with your kids and really see what's going on in their heart. Don't be satisfied just because they're playing the violin, playing the piano, singing songs, doing sermons, etc. I say, watch them off the pulpit. Watch them when they put the violin and the cello and the rest down. What are they doing with their downtime, especially when they hang out with their friends? Pay attention to that. Because I, too, had the violin, the cello players, and all the rest. But there were some things that I missed. And God has allowed me to do something which is called redeeming the time. He's allowed me to do it. And it was a devastating blow. You know, our family is known. We've been to places that some children may not ever go. And they were very privileged. And I would always tell them, I said, you know, you guys, you guys are a witness. You know, people are watching. And today, some of the decisions they're making, not the best. Worthy of redirection and correction. They have not given up on Jesus, and I praise the Lord for that. They are still in the struggle. They do still listen to counsel. And like I told you, three still live with us and four still live with us but doesn't live with us. We're still trying to figure that one out. In other words, he comes by a lot. But we love him. We, we, we love him dearly. We, we, want him, we actually want him with us. We have no problem with our children staying with us still. But I know that there's still some work for me to do as a father and for my lovely wife who I know is watching right now. Love you, girl. 
But, you know, the reality is, is that we have accepted that though all of our children are in their 20s, 21 to 24, they are literally 21, 22, 23, 24. But we all can see, still need mom and still need dad in their life, and we're happy to be there. But the key is, is that we got some work to do to have our homes restored after the pattern of God. And so let's go over some principles. Principle number one, lead by example. It's never too late to still lead by example. Any contact that you have with your children, you are still being manifested as a leader. You may not say, son, now I'm talking to you as a leader. You don't have to announce it. It's how you just conduct yourself. You conduct yourself as a leader. Now, if you're going to lead, lead by example. The Bible says it like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Now, what does it say next? And... Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. God says first things first. It must be in your heart. Then after it's in your heart, it's going to come out of the mouth too because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But God makes it clear. You and I are called to be examples. Family. This is where, unfortunately, some of us are messing up, right? We teach right principles to our children that we ourselves don't follow. We got to plead with God, Lord, help me to break my inconsistency and my hypocrisy. It is sowing negative seed, not positive seed. We must go before God and say, Lord, I must learn to lead by example. Remember, brothers... This includes if you're married and you don't have children. For I remember a story of a man named Lot. And the Bible says that the angels came to Lot and the angels said to Lot, get your family together and get out of this house. Two words literally were the foundation of Lot's wife, not being lost temporarily, but being lost eternally. Two words. The Bible says in Genesis 19, Lot lingered. Lot lingered. In other words, the angel, God gave a clear instruction to the leader of the home. Take your family, do this. And Lot was like, but, huh. And he lingered. Now watch. You got to watch the rest of the story. The Bible then says that the angels grabbed Lot's hand. Now, how do we know that what Lot did affected his wife? Because it then said, and the angels grabbed his wife's hand. And then it said, and the angel grabbed the children's hands. So what was it that was happening? What was happening is what Lot did affected everybody else. And it affected his wife permanently. So again, I must accept, and gentlemen, you must accept, single brothers, you need to accept that if you're going to be married, you are entering into the most sacred and holy office that you could ever enter into as now a husband and a father. And God is counting on you to lead your family. And how do we lead? By example. It is imperative that we do what we can and lead by example before our children before even our spouses. Now, there are some examples in the Bible of what can happen when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, if we yield to the voice of God's Spirit, if we submit to God and let Him have His way in our hearts, there's some pretty nice rewards. Take a look. One of the rewards, the Bible says demons can be cast out of our children. When we are yielding to God and allowing His Spirit to have residence within our hearts, We can have so much power that we can command a demon to come out of our child. Not only that, we can cause aggressive behavior to cease. Not only that, we can quiet the influence of Satan when he's momentarily controlling the mind of our children. This is all the the things that can happen when we are filled with the presence of God's spirit. More and more of God's spirit, real heaven-born power. Not only that, 
we can identify their true condition and speak to their future. Speak to their future. A tragedy took place a little a year or so ago, last year actually. A young man died suddenly. And boy, did it impact my children. They all knew him and loved him. He was family. And he just died, 19 years old. I mean, like literally on the phone yesterday with him, talking and laughing. Next day, dead. Just dropped dead. I remember I had to tell my children. They were like, Dad, what's going on? And I said, Onaje just died. And they started screaming and everything. And I remember all of my children were home, and we were all together by the couch. And everybody's crying and sad. And I felt so powerless. I said, Lord, my my children need some help right now. Father, what would you have me to do? And I remember that the Spirit of God impressed my heart. Sing. I said, Lord, I don't really feel like singing right now. The Spirit of the Lord was like, sing. And, I, and I'm there, and everybody's just looking down at their feet and overwhelmed with sadness. And I just began, there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. And as I just started singing that, by the time we got to the, oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, all of a sudden, they start crying. And then we hold each other. And I remember that when I had to go to take care of some business, they're sending me text messages. Dad, you have no idea how much we needed to hear that song. We were questioning, where is God and all these things. And he was, we were near to the heart of God in that moment. Family, I promise you, the more that you avail your heart to say, Lord, Take my heart and truly let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. The Spirit of God will give you more power than the devil that's trying to control your family. And you will literally be able to say, thou foul and and that foul demon come out of my child and enter no more into him. And you'd be amazed at how it will happen. Don't become so intellectual that you forget sometimes we're in a spiritual warfare. Sometimes it's going to take more than you quoting a verse. Don't let demons laugh at you and say, listen, Jesus we know and Paul we know. We don't know who you are, so you might as well go back to your business. You and I want to be on our knees pleading with God and saying more of your spirit, more of your presence, oh God, so that we have more in us than they have in them. Some power that's available to you. Luke 5, 17, the power of the Lord is present to heal. It's like there's way more power available to us that we don't have to keep failing as much as we're failing. Stop acting like you serve a weak God. You serve the king of the universe. Start believing. And if you don't believe, ask God, Lord, help my unbelief. Take me away from this intellectual approach to the gospel simply and teach me how to be filled with your spirit and live a holy life practically. We need it. This is why I told you last night, that whole conservative stuff. That's the problem with us. We're happy being conservative rather than Christian. We're satisfied. We're a conservative church. We're conservative this, conservative. Give me a break. It's like conservative. I love how Ellen White calls it. She says the superficial conservative class. That's exactly what many of us are. We're just superficial. We got all sorts of demons still in our heart. All sorts of hatred, malice, anger, resentment, bitterness, towards people and stuff, all you got to do is say the wrong thing to me, and in righteousness, I will cut you off. (laughs) We are a bona fide mess. Thank God Jesus came to save a mess. And Christ is saying, listen, when you're born again, when you're converted, oh, yeah, you'll, you'll be able to strengthen the brethren. But the reality is, is that God says, principle number one, make a covenant with God. I will lead by a better example. Now, 
What I like about this study we're doing is that this study is twofold. This study are principles on repairing a broken home, but these are also principles on establishing a home. And what's the first principle? Lead by example. Am I talking to all members of the family? Yes. But who am I predominantly talking to? I'm talking to the dads, talking to the fathers, I'm talking to the husbands. Now, principle number two. Let's admit, <laughs> some of us have not led by example. Some of us have led our children into sin. You know, there's a sweeping thing that I see happening. I've been a resident now of California for a couple of years. And uh, yeah, there's some stuff I'm noticing. So <coughs> reformation is really hard with us. Um, I'm starting to hear more and more and more Seventh-day Adventist Christians going to the movie theaters, going to all the competitive sports games, and a lot of other stuff. And I'm like, are y'all going to act like you never read before? Are you going to tell me that you didn't read these volumes that we have? as well as the clear text of Scripture? We have counsel on these things. But yet many of us as God's people, I guess, we're just kind of bypassing it and kind of doing what we want. And it's hurting our influence. And one day when you get serious about God and when you're really about the finishing of his work, we're going to have to go back to our children and say, I am sorry for the poor example that I left for you, for the example that I left for you. And I get it. I've also realized that uh, being out here in California, I'm realizing that I've never met such a large group of individuals that have gone through some serious mental, emotional attacks and have suffered trauma like we talked about. So here's what's happening. I'm meeting a lot of people like this. And my wife and I, that was part of the two-hour conversation that my wife and I were having last night, is my wife and I are consumed with the idea of striking balance. Striking balance. So here's what a lot of young adults, young people have gone through, and here's what's happening. Some of them are growing up in really conservative homes or so-called present truth homes, right? Right? What does that mean? That means no bad music, no bad dress, no bad uh, movies, no bad food, no bad, no bad, no bad, no bad, right? Avoid a lot of stuff. Some of those counsels were biblical and on point, but some of those counsels were unbiblical, extreme, and fanatical. Maybe we can talk about some of those teachings during our Q&A session later on. So here's what happens. They came in with all this strict religion. They found out that they became more judgmental and they were, you know, they, they were, they, there was things going on in their character they saw was not of God. So in the name of being liberated, they went from far right to far left. And now all of a sudden, they're wearing more jewelry than you've ever seen before. They're painted up and dolled up. Their clothing is shocking. They're at all of the party houses and lots of fun places that God's people should not be. And they do all of this in the name of being liberated from fanaticism. And what they don't understand is Satan is a master trapper. He doesn't just set one trap here. He sets one over here too and over here and over here. And he sets it in everywhere. And so what ends up happening is we start thinking in the name of being liberalized and free from bondage of fanaticism. And we end up living lifestyles that are still contrary to the word of God, still contrary to true holiness. And we teach this stuff to our children. I'm watching friends and family members do this right now. In the name of being free from fanaticism, now they're introducing their children to all sorts of foul music. 
and introducing them to all sorts of stuff, and they are damaging their kids because their focus is wrong. They want to keep their kids in the church, but we just already talked about that. We're not successful just because we keep our kids in the church. Our work is successful is when we keep our kids in Christ. Big difference. And so we must lead by example. And if we don't, we're just going to find ourselves at this precious place here. And it's okay to be here. Sometimes we have to just say, you know what, son? You know what, daughter? I'm sorry. Dad was a little extreme. I was doing my best, and I honestly thought I was honoring God. But as I studied and prayed more, I realized I was wrong, and I want to be man enough to come to you and to apologize. In our home, as the Lemon family, we never just say, I'm sorry. We say, I am sorry, and we ask, will you forgive me? Because sometimes you can say, I'm sorry, and the person's like, okay. And they just kind of walk away, and you don't know where you're at with that individual. And so a lot of times we say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? You see, the Bible says it like this in Matthew 5. It says, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Brother, by the way, is a family term. It says, leave there thy gift before the altar. Go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. So the reality is that knowing that all this drama is going on with us and our family members and going to worship anyhow is out of harmony with God's word. God says you prioritize to make wrongs right with you and your family before you come and offer me your gifts of worship. Do you see why the Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath? You see that? Anybody know anybody who went to bed last night and didn't wake up the next morning? Do we have some family members like that? I just found out one of the artists that I used to dance for in the entertainment industry, Don Newkirk. That was my brother. That was my friend. We used to dance together. He was part of hip hop. He was part of R&B. And when I was in the world, he was the guy that I danced for. A few days ago, he's posted on Facebook. Next thing you know, hey, guys, Don died. People are just here today and gone tomorrow. And so God is saying, listen, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't offer me your gift. Go and be reconciled to your brother. Go be reconciled to your sister. Go be reconciled. Do what you can. And if you need to apologize, then go ahead and apologize. Family, it's very powerful when you can go to your children or go to your spouse in honesty and humility and say, I realize I was wrong. No buts. But is goat language. That's what buts do. They butt heads. Goats are lost. Sheep are saved. So no goat language. You know, I I was wrong. But if you didn't do what you did, it's like goat. That's goat. No goat. Only sheep. It's like I acknowledge what I've done, and I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? You'd be amazed at how much healing could take place in some of our broken homes if we could just simply learn to say those three special words, I am sorry. And so go ahead and make the apologies where you need to make it. Number three, put in action the rescue plan. This is my favorite part. You see, there's a rescue plan that God wants to give to restore our home. After you have covenanted with God, I will be a better example I will apologize where I need to. Then the next step is put in action the rescue plan. You see, God puts the rescue plan like this in Ephesians 5. He says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The word redeeming means in the Greek to rescue from loss or improve your opportunities. From this point forward... Improve your opportunities. Redeeming the time is not rewinding the time. You can't rewind time, but you can redeem time. You can say from this day forward, I'll be a better dad. I'll be a better son. I'll be a better daughter. I'll be a better mother. I'll be a better wife and a husband. You can do that. You can make that decision today. And the question is how? Like, 
What can we do? So here are four quick principles that I want to give you on the rescue plan. How can we put in action the rescue plan or redeem the time so that our families can be restored? Well, there are four things that was left as an example for us in Scripture. And repetition is necessary. I already taught this to Mentone. But sometimes we need to hear it again because maybe our minds were in one place before and now our minds are in a different place. But there are four things that we can do. I want to show you these four things and I believe that God is going to bless in a very special way. Four principles of restoring the home with our children. Principle number one, find ways to work together. Where do we get this from? Notice this text. This text is pretty powerful. In Mark 6 and verse 3, the question was asked, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Who is the carpenter according to the verse? Who is the carpenter? It's Jesus, right? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? That's probably the clearest clue, right? the son of Mary. So Jesus is the carpenter. Now watch this one. This is from Matthew 13, verse 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Who is the carpenter in this verse? It was Joseph, Jesus's father. So what is the indirect lesson we're getting from it? The father and the son were working together. God says, find ways to work together with your family. Things that you can do in the spiritual world, you can work together in ministry. There are things you can do in the world of benevolence. You can say, hey, as a family, we're going to go help somebody in their lawn and clean it up, or we're going to help somebody in their yard and get things better. You can also, in business, say, you know what? I'm going to go and get a business started, and I want my children or my spouse to be one of my partners in helping in some way strengthen our business. The key is is that God believes in communion. And the more that we find ways to connect and to commune with each other, it allows us to exchange heart with heart, skill with skill, thought with thought, and it brings us closer together as family members. Find ways to work together, whether it's temporal work, whether it's spiritual work, whether it's business or whether it's benevolent. But the key is, is that in scripture, we see that fathers prioritized spending time with their sons, not just simply giving Bible verses, but sometimes they would just find projects and they would work together. And if there's one thing I could say for those of you who do it, I know that out here in Southern California, some may be privileged, some are not, but if you have, an, if you have a garden, grow things together with your children. Children enjoy food better that they were part of the process in growing. That's a fact. Even the nasty stuff. You know, it's like if they don't like spinach, for some reason, they're way more open to it if they played a part in it growing out of the ground. It's like you, you can say, try, if you say try the spinach, no, mom, I'm all right. Here, try your spinach. You grew this. Oh, I, yeah, yeah, let me try that. You know, all of a sudden, the whole attitude changes. But find ways to work together. Now, in addition to that, study together. And I like this picture because this picture is a grandmother, a mother, and a child. And you know why I like this picture? Because this comes straight out the Bible, doesn't it? Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, and that from a child, talking to Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, Timothy, from a child, was wise in understanding the scriptures. How was he able to do that? When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother, Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Spend time together studying. Pick topics. 
Don't be afraid of the topics. If your child wants to know what's so wrong with this dad, what's so wrong with this mom, that is an opportunity to say, no problem. Let's study it together. Don't just simply say, it's wrong. Don't just say shallow things like, the prophet of God said so. That's too shallow for people who have not developed a firm faith yet. So you got to go ahead and say, oh, you want to know what's so wrong with dating outside of the family or outside of, you know, the Adventist family, outside of our faith? What's so wrong with that? Okay, let's go through that together. What's so wrong with jewelry? Okay, let's go through that together. What's so wrong with what's so wrong with? Let's go ahead and let's study together. But life is more than doctrine, isn't it? Do we want our children to be uh, strong financially? Do we want our spouses to be strong? Typically in a home, you have one financial master and nobody else. Typically in a home, there's one person who manages the money. What if that person dies? What if that person goes through an accident and suffers something that they can't do what they used to do? Now you got to take over. So guess what? Why doesn't everybody learn it? If it's financial management, hey, let's pick a time to study together and let's understand principles on financial management. You can study about things that are temporal and you can study about things that are eternal. But the key is take time not only to work together, but take time to study together. You can do this even with family members who no longer live with you. You simply call them up. You say, hey, once a month. We're going to have a Zoom meeting or some type of conference call, and we're going to just study certain subjects out. We'd love to have you on the call. You invite them. In time, they may come. Now, in addition to that, family worship. Family worship is very clear from the Bible. The Bible is clear. There was always an evening and a morning sacrifice. Again, if your family members are still in the home, even if they're adults, you let them know a rule in our home is we come together for family worship. And you go ahead and you have your family worship. Now, the Bible is really clear on how often this happens. In Joshua 1 and verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it how often? Day and night. Again, in Psalm 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates how often? Day and night and night. Then you have 2 Timothy 1 and verse 3. I thank God whom I serve or worship with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers. How often? Night and day. Again, Revelation 7 and verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve or worship him. How often? Day and night. So how often should we have family worship? Day and night. In the morning is where everybody gets the charge. That is, okay, we just learned about being more patient and the rewards thereof. So what are we going to do today when we go to work? Whenever opportunities that are agitating come up, we are going to exercise the patience of the saints that we just studied about. That's our morning worship. That's the charge. In the evening worship, that's the review the evening worship is, praise the Lord, what experiences did we all have today to, em to demonstrate patience? Oh, Dad, this guy, he called me and she was, uh, or he was so rude. My daughter had to answer phones at an organization one time. Dad, it was so I wanted to just let that person know about themselves. But I remembered our worship this morning, and I was able to just whisper a prayer in my heart and say, okay, sir, how can I help you? And then we celebrate that victory together. But every morning and every evening, we go ahead and we spend time in worship. Recreation. What is life without a little bit of enjoyment? All work and no play really does make Jack a dull boy, and even God agrees. And so it is that we must also spend time in recreation, having some enjoyment. Now, this is where fathers stop being so boring. Don't be just Bible thumpers. You got to go ahead and know how to get dirty with your children. You got to know how to go ahead and enjoy what they enjoy as well. Take the time and go ahead and enter into some of the things that they're experiencing. The Bible says, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
One of the ways we can provoke our children to wrath is not spending enough time with them in recreation. You don't want your children to only identify you as the guy who gives instructions, the one who establishes law and all these things. You want to be able to have it in their minds. My dad knows how to throw down and have some fun with me when it's time. I remember when I was a director at Tacoa Missions in New Hampshire. And my daughter, Jada, was like, Dad, can you come outside and do cartwheels with me? I was like, oh, yeah, no doubt. So I said, go ahead outside. I'll meet you in a second. So we get outside. And my daughter's like, okay, Dad, I'm going to go first. And then she goes ahead. Now, we had new missionaries come in. The new missionaries, they don't know us yet. So they just know what they see on TV or whatever. So one of the missionaries, he looks at me like, like he had this shocked look. Because I'm just like, all right, I said, I'm coming, I'm coming. So I'm bouncing up and down like that. Like, you know, all right, we're going to go, we're going to go. And I'm ready to have fun. He's looking at me like. <laughs> and I was just like, what's wrong? And he's just like, you do cartwheels with your children? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I, I didn't know you did things like that. I said, what do you think? Do you think I go to bed with a Bible in my hand all the time? It's like, <laughs> just because you preach present truth does not mean that you don't have fun. <laughs> Jesus played with children. And you better believe I did it. So I said, I got to go. So I went outside, and I'm, and I'm doing cartwheels and everything else. This brother's pulling out his camera. Dwayne Lemon is playing cartwheels with his children. <laughs> you know, and... I realize that sometimes when we preach strong, people think we don't laugh or have good times or even crack innocent jokes. It's like they, they don't get it. It's like, no, you could be 100% a normal person and you can have really good, innocent fun with your children. And it's one of the most wonderful ways to win their hearts. Even the Bible says, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls doing what? Playing in the streets thereof. And God wants parents to know how to play with their children as well. In closing, there are five principles that a beautiful study on kidmenscience.com did a pretty awesome study on five things that families did that help keep the children in the church. Look at what they said. Notice it says from 18 to 29, learn why 25% stayed connected with Christ from 18 to 29. Notice that. What did they stay connected to? The church? They stay connected to Christ. Now, keep in mind, if you're connected to Christ, will you be in the church? But can you be in the church and not connected to Christ? So the goal is connect them with Christ. That should be our emphasis. Now, watch. It says, why do 25% stay connected with Christ from 18 to 29? Very hard area of helping individuals. Number one, they ate dinner five or seven nights a week as a family. Some of you, maybe that's impossible because of work schedules. You do the best you can. But if it is possible, make it more of a priority. Don't sit in front of a TV. Very dangerous. Even if it's innocent programming, it takes away for the opportunities of communion. I love the home that we're in right now. Man, our dining room table is in another room. We have a room where we have a TV, no network or anything. You know, we just watch what we choose to watch. But the key is, is that no eating on the couch in front of that TV, even if it's innocent programming. No, we're going to go to the dining table. And that's where we want to go ahead and eat, where we can talk and talk about our day. Number two. They served with their families in a ministry. This is the area where my family and I were very strong, is we would go out and we would serve. You have to ask yourself, what can I do with my children that we can serve in ministry together? Number three, I like this one. They were entrusted with responsibility in ministry at an early age. That's huge. Give your child something that they own it. They own that service. It's like, son, daughter, you're in charge of this, okay? This is for the ministry. I will follow up with you, but this is your project, right? Number four, this was huge. I never did this. And I said, wow, Lord, I like that. And even now, 
I'm asking, because my children are still fairly uh, uh, influential, not only influential, but easily influenced. So I still am trying to do this. Look at number four. They had one spiritual experience in the home during the week. Now, for us, uh, that's talking about family worship. That's the one we did. That's not an issue. It's number five. So again, they had just one spiritual experience in the home during the week. So imagine if we had family worship every day. We give ourselves the upper edge. Number five is the one I never did. Had at least one faith-focused adult in their lives other than their parents. I never did that. I was like, oh, man, I said I never did that. You have a faith focus, somebody who's strong. They are an adult, they're mature, but they are involved in their lives as well, outside of father and mother. They said that the more that people put these five principles into practice, they ended up staying connected with Christ as they arrived at adult ages. So these are five principles that we can consider that if you're not doing it, now you can start working towards it. The last thing I want to encourage you to do is to emotionally invest in your children. This is especially for teenagers and young adults. The more that they become teenagers and young adults, their interests change, their views of life change, a lot of stuff changes. When they change in this area, this is a very crucial time that we must try to enter into their interests even if it's not your own. If you don't know how to, learn it. Start saying, okay, what can I do to learn how to connect better with my son or my daughter since they're changing, and how can we do this? Because that rocked my world. When my children started changing and started questioning certain things, like, you know, just reforms, you know, why do I have to dress this way, why do I have to whatever? It's like when when those questions come up, you know, as a parent, you kind of get used to the easy reasoning. Oh, the Bible says, da da da, okay. And they're like, oh, okay, daddy. Well, when they get older, they're kind of like, um, I don't see it like that. And it's kind of like, what do you mean you don't see it like that? Well, how do you see it? And then they might come up with some strange idea that maybe doesn't even make a lot of sense to you. And what do you do as a parent? You shut it down. You say, well, I'm sorry, but this is what it says, so this is what you need to be doing. That does not work. That does not work long term. When they get to a certain age, you need to learn how to enter their world. And you need to learn how to enter their world without judgment. And you need to learn how to listen. And sometimes, bite your tongue. I remember when my son Caleb, you know, he started uh, getting interest in a girl. Now, I told told my children, I said, look, no, no dating until at least you're 20 years old. Right? Now, why did I say that? I said that largely because inspiration says it. It says children should be out of their teens before they start entering into courtship. But in addition to that, there's just a level of maturity. Be finished with school. You know, we had certain rules that were very, very sound, very reasonable. But now, here it is, you know, he's independent, right? He's 19, I think, at the time. And he's like, yeah, Dad, you know, I I got this girl. So so we go on a boat together. And I said, come on, man, let's go on a boat. So we went on a boat together, and we're on the lake, and we're just rowing. And he starts talking to me about this girl that he likes. And I was like, really? And I said, "Uh, okay. I said, so why do you like her? And he said, she is so beautiful. And I said, anything else? And he's just like, well, she's pretty nice and da-da-da-da. And he was like, you know, talking about like he wanted to kiss her. So at that moment, there's this being inside of me that wanted to jump out. (laughs) And just be like, are you crazy? Bro, you know. And, all the, and I just wanted to go there. But that was the moment I was like, huh, and I had to bite my tongue. And I was just like, so what makes you want to kiss her? <laughs> it was like torture. Because, <laughs> you, you know, the, the parent side of you is oozing out to just direct, give instructions, and so on. But that's not how you connect. So I'm just kind of like, okay. I said, can I ask you a question? He was like, yes. I was like, are you still a virgin? He was like, oh, yeah. I was like, oh, praise God, praise God. <laughs> you know, so in other words, they start changing. 
And there's times the director in you wants to come out and just shut it down. But these are going to be times you got to learn how to listen. You got to be like Jesus. And sometimes if our children are entertaining certain sins, you got to treat them like sinners. And how do we treat sinners? With patience, with kindness, with gentleness, with listening, without judgment, etc. Now you got to do that even with your own son or daughter. What does inspiration say about this as we close? Emotional investment is when we focus our emotions in the form of our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors into anything that we hope over time will help us grow and sustain our emotional well-being. This is emotional investment. This is something my wife and I are really huge in. Uh, We started getting, um, you know, we got like a master certification in health coaching, and uh, one of the classes I enjoyed most was positive psychology. And the positive psychology and motivating interviewing motivational interviewing, I had to admit, I said, this is incredible. I mean, it was a beautiful way of connecting with minds without judgment. And and I needed that. That helped me. All right. Now, look, emotional investment, whether it be with husband and wife, whether it be with parent and child, we need to learn how to invest emotionally with our children and stay connected. Here we go. And this is wrapping up. You've been very patient. I'm about to wrap it up right here. The father should frequently gather his children around him and lead their minds into channels of moral and religious light. He should study their different tendencies and susceptibilities and reach them through the plainest avenues. This is your job, guys. We need to study our children and study their tendencies and their susceptibilities and reach them in the most simplest ways. Continuing, some, now this, is, this was beautiful counsel for me. Some may be best influenced through veneration and the fear of God. Literally, that is my oldest son. That is the way to reach him. Then it says, others, through the manifestation of his benevolence and wise providence, calling forth their deep gratitude. That is hands down my son, Caleb. You know, so literally I'm writing notes because I have this in my notes and I'm writing down my children's names next to what I'm seeing, right? Then it says, Others may be more deeply impressed by opening before them the wonders and mysteries of the natural world with all its delicate harmony and beauty which speak to their souls of him who is the creator of the heavens and the earth and all the beautiful things therein. It will not do to lay down an iron rule. Boy, this was helpful. It will not do. Oh, I forgot it's here. It will not do to lay down an iron rule by which every member of the family is forced into the same discipline. Don't do that. Because there are differences and variations in their personalities, you can't discipline everybody the same way because the goal in discipline is to disciple. It's to win them, right? So it says, it is better to exalt a milder sway And when any special lesson is required to reach the consciences of the youth through their individual tastes and mark points of character. You see how we have to connect with our children in order to do this? Because what are we noticing? We're noticing their individual tastes and their marked points of character. You can't know that unless you spend time with them. Right? Continuing. While there should be a uniformity in the family discipline, it should be varied to meet the wants of different members of the family. It should be the parents' study not to arouse the combativeness of their children, not to excite them to anger and rebellion, but to interest them and inspire them with a desire to attend to the highest intelligence and perfection of character." This can be done in a spirit of Christian sympathy and forbearance. The parents realizing the peculiar dangers of their children and firmly yet kindly restraining their propensities to sin. I was floored that this was written in 1877. Like a lot of those counsels sounded like one of these modern books that you read. This is the testimony of Jesus. This is what was given to us. And I remember I went to my wife just shy. I said, honey, I said, this is like reading one of these modern books on motivational this, that. This is from the pen of inspiration. And we have been striving and continue to strive to put these principles into action. Family, the bottom line is it was God's plan 
for the members of the family to be associated in work and study, in worship and recreation. The father as priest of his household and both father and mother as teachers and companions of their children. God has a plan to restore our homes. God has a plan to restore our families. And family, God has shown us some beautiful principles that we can put into practice. And so my question to you is how many of us are in this room that recognize that our families need some refurbishing and that by the grace of God, Lord, I will put these principles into practice. Whether your children are youth or even young adults, you can still do it. And in the Q&A session, we'll talk a little bit more how. But if you're willing to say, Lord, these principles will be the principles that govern my home from this day forward, please stand to your feet with me. I want to pray with you. And I know that God is going to bless you beyond your expectations. And the Lord is going to do for us that which we could never do for ourselves. And I praise his name for it. Let us go ahead and let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much that you have a plan. We're so grateful that you have a plan to restore as well as to establish families. And so, Lord, we're grateful that we have come to a point where we now see more clearly your plan for us as individuals, healthy, happy, holy, recognizing our traumas and through different mediums, mostly through Christ, overcoming. And then, Lord, we saw that you have standards and principles for couples who come together in holy matrimony. And now, Father, we see that you have principles even for the entire family at large. Lord, I pray, help us that we will be faithful to the high calling that you have impressed upon our hearts today. And to remember, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. This is our prayer and our thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope and pray that this service has uplifted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and that you personally have been drawn closer to Him. If you have any questions or comments, please text us at 909-492-0738 or email us at office at mentonechurch.org. We look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.